Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Stone. I gave this speech at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair for the ladies of the Congress of Women. The topic was the progress of the last 50 years. The commencement of the last 50 years is about the beginning of that great change and improvement in the condition of women which exceeds all the gains of hundreds of years before. Four years in advance of the last 50, in 1833, Oberlin College in Ohio was founded. Its charter declared its grand object to give the most useful education at the least expense of health, time, and money, and to extend the benefits of such education to both sexes and to all classes. And the elevation of the female character by bringing within the reach of the misjudged and neglected sex all the instructive privileges which have hitherto unreasonably distinguished the leading sex from theirs. These were the words of Father Shippen, which, if not heard in form, were heard in fact as widely as the world. The opening of Oberlin to women marked an epoch. In all outward circumstances, this beginning was like the coming of the babe of Bethlehem, in utter poverty. Its first hall was of rough slabs with the bark still on. Other departments corresponded, but a new Messiah had come. Yet, but a truth once uttered, and tis like a star newborn that drops into its place, and which, once circling in its placid round, not all the tumult of the earth can shake. Henceforth the leaves of the tree of knowledge were for women and for the healing of the nations. About this time, Mary Lyon began a movement to establish Mount Holyoke Seminary. Amherst College was nearby. Its students were educated to be missionaries. They must have educated wives. It was tacitly understood and openly asserted that Mount Holyoke Seminary was to meet this demand. But whatever the reason, the idea was born that women could and should be educated. It lifted a mountain load from woman. It shattered the idea everywhere pervasive as the atmosphere that women were incapable of education and would be less womanly, less desirable in every way if they had it. However much it may have been resented, women accepted the idea of their intellectual inequality. I asked my brother, can girls learn Greek? The anti-slavery cause had come to break stronger fetters than those that held the slave. The idea of equal rights was in the air. The wail of the slave, his clanking fetters, his utter need appealed to everybody. Women heard. Angelina and Sarah Grimke and Abby Kelly went out to speak for the slaves. Such a thing had never been heard of. An earthquake shock could hardly have startled the community more. Some of the abolitionists forgot the slave in their efforts to silence the women. The anti-slavery society rent itself in twain over the subject. The church was moved to its very foundation in opposition. The Association of Congregational Churches issued a pastoral letter against the public speaking of women. The press, many-tongued, surpassed itself in reproaches upon these women who had so far departed from their sphere as to speak in public. But with anointed lips and a consecration which put life itself at stake, these peerless women pursued the even tenor of their way, saying to their opponents only, Woe is me if I preach not this gospel of freedom for the slave. Over all came the melody of Whittier's, When women's heart is breaking, shall women's voice be hushed? I think with never-ending gratitude that the young women of today do not and can never know at what price their right to free speech and to speak at all in public has been earned. Abby Kelly once entered a church only to find herself the subject of the sermon, which was preached from the text, This Jezebel has come among us also. They jeered at her as she went along the street. They threw stones at her. They pelted her with bad eggs as she stood on the platform. Some of the advocates of the very cause for which she endured all of this were ready to drive her from the field. Mr. Garrison and Wendell Phillips stood by her, but so great was the opposition that one faction of the abolitionists left and formed a new organization after a vain effort to put Abby Kelly off from the committee in which she had been nominated.
the right to education and to free speech having been gained for women in the long run every other good thing was sure to be obtained half a century ago women were at an infinite disadvantage in regard to their occupations the idea that their sphere was at home and only at home was like a band of steel on society but the spinning wheel and the loom which gave employment to women had been superseded by machinery and something else had to take their places the taking care of the house and the children and the family sewing and teaching the little summer school at a dollar per week could not supply the needs nor fill the aspirations of women but every departure from these conceited things was met with the cry you want to get out of your sphere and that was to fly in the face of providence to be monstrous women women who while they orated in public wanted men to rock the cradle and wash the dishes we pleaded that whatever was fit to be done at all might with propriety be done by anybody who did it well and that the tools belonged to those who could use them that the possession of a power presupposed a right to its use this was urged from city to city from state to state women were encouraged to try new occupations we endeavored to create that wholesome discontent in women that would compel them to reach out after far better things but every new step was a trial and a conflict men printers left when women took the type they formed unions and they pledged themselves not to work for men who employed women but these tools belong to women and today a great many women are printers unquestioned when harriet hossamer found within herself the artist's soul and sought by the study of anatomy to prepare herself for her work she was repelled as out of her sphere and indelicate and not a medical college in all of new england or in the middle states would admit her she persevered aided by her father's wealth and influence dr mcdowell the dean of the medical college in st louis admitted her the field of art is now open to women but as late as the time when models for the statue of charles sumner were made although that of annie whitney in the judgment of the committee took precedence of all the rest they refused to reward her the contract for the statue when they knew that the model was the work of a woman but her beautiful samuel adams and leif erickson and the fine handiwork of other artists are argument and proof that the field of art belongs to women when mrs tyndale of philadelphia assumed her husband's business after his death importing china ware sending his ships to china enlarging her warehouse and increasing her business the fact was quoted as a wonder when mrs young of lowell massachusetts opened a shoe store in lowell though she sold only shoes for women and children people peered in curiously to see how she looked today the whole field of trade is open to women when elizabeth blackwell studied medicine and put up her sign in new york she was regarded as fair game and she was called a she-doctor the college that had admitted her closed its doors afterward against other women and supposed that they were shut out forever but dr blackwell was a woman of fine intellect and of great personal worth and a level head how good it was that such a woman was the first doctor she was well equipped by study at home and abroad and prepared to contend with prejudice and every opposing thing at a price the younger women doctors do not know the way was open for women physicians the first woman minister antoinette brown had to meet ridicule and opposition that can hardly be conceived of today now there are women ministers east and west all over the country in massachusetts where properly qualified persons were allowed to practice law the supreme court decided that a woman was not a person and a special act of the legislature had to be passed before miss lalia robinson could be admitted to the bar but today women are lawyers fifty years ago the legal injustice imposed upon women was appalling wives widows and mothers seemed to have been hunted out by the law on purpose to see in how many ways they could be wronged and made helpless a wife by her marriage lost all right to any personal property she might have the income of her land went to her husband so that she was made absolutely penniless if a woman earned a dollar by scrubbing her husband had a right to take the dollar and go out and get drunk with it and beat her afterwards it was his dollar if a woman wrote a book 
the copyright of the same belonged to her husband and not to her the law counted out in many states how many cups and saucers spoons and knives and chairs a widow might have when her husband died i have seen many a widow who took the cups she bought before she was married and bought them again after her husband died so that she might have them legally the law gave no right to married women to any legal existence at all she could neither sue nor be sued if she had a child born alive the law gave her husband the use of all her real estate as long as he should live and called it by the pleasant name of the estate by courtesy when the husband died the law gave the widow the use of one-third of the real estate belonging to him and called it the widow's encumbrance while the law dealt thus with her in regard to her property it dealt still more hardly with her in regard to her children no married mother could have any right to her child and in most states of the union that is the law today but the laws in regard to personal and property rights of women have been greatly changed and improved and we are very grateful to the men who have done it we have not only gained in the fact that the laws are modified women have acquired a certain amount of political power we have now in twenty states school suffrage for women forty years ago there was but one kentucky allowed widows with children of school age to vote on school questions we have also municipal suffrage for women in kansas and full suffrage in wyoming a state larger than all of new england the last half century has gained for women the right to the highest education and entrance to all professions and occupations or nearly all as a result we have women's clubs the women's congress women's educational industrial unions the moral education societies the women's relief corps police matrons the women's christian temperance union colleges for women and coeducational colleges and the harvard annex medical schools and medical societies open to women women's hospitals women in the pulpit women as a power in the press authors women artists women beneficent societies and helping hand societies women school supervisors and factory inspectors and prison inspectors women on state boards of charity the international council of women the women's national council and last but not least the board of lady managers and not one of these things was allowed fifty years ago except the opening of oberlin by what toil and fatigue and patience and strife and the beautiful law of growth has all of this been wrought these things have not come of themselves they could not have occurred except as the great movement for women has brought them out and about they are part of the eternal order and they have come to stay now all we need is to continue to speak the truth fearlessly and we shall add to our number those who will turn the scale to the side of equal and full justice in all things